Writer's Block and the Garbage Can. When I first became a published novelist, I didn't believe in writer's block. I assumed it was sort of a mental constipation. And like old age and cancer, I didn't want to believe in it. Not for myself. If I believed in writer's block, it would happen to me. If I didn't, I wouldn't catch it. But sometimes I would find myself in a mass of confusion examining the book I was writing blankly, staring at the next scene, asking, is this the right thing to do? Does this book have a plot? What's the meaning of it all? What is this story really about? Who are these people? I've written over 30 women's fiction novels and three thrillers over the years. And in that time, doubt and confusion have attacked me many times. Over time, I realized that I am not alone. Almost every writer I've asked has admitted to attacks of sou- <laughs> Almost every writer I've asked has admitted to attacks of self-doubt and confusion. Whether we call it writer's block or not, sometimes we get stuck. Why do a writer's words grind to a halt? Most important, how do we fix it? Should we have a fight with our characters? Write regardless? Cry? Over the years, I've tried each of these tactics, trying to understand what the easy flow of words is about and why the words sometimes stop. And then I don't know what happens next or who these story people are, where they come from, or where they're going. It's painful. I know there's a story here, but I don't know what happens next. So I play around with it a bit, not pushing, but tossing little bits of fertilizer into my subconscious. I might read, scan through a baby name book, wonder what sort of name fits this character I've given birth to, or toss around different scenarios for the character. But mostly I try to leave my subconscious alone because I've learned this works best. But what do I do when nothing works? I have a story I really need to write, but it won't budge. I know something's wrong. I fear I'll never finish the book, that it will never work, that the characters will perish on my computer's hard drive or languish in my ideas folder, which has been growing for 30 years. Once, when I found myself un unwilling to write the next scene, I heard myself say, I wish I could jump over this part and get on to the interesting stuff. So I leapt over the part I didn't want to write, telling myself I would do it later. When I did go back, all I needed to join the two scenes was a transitional paragraph. Ah, my writing began to flow again. I learned that many problems could be solved by transitional sentences, paragraphs, or scene breaks, shifting the reader to another time, another place, or another character's viewpoint. But what if after I try all these things, they don't work? What do I do when I love the story or I thought I did, but I can't fix it? Now it's time for the garbage can test. I developed the garbage can test some years ago when I was giving a weekend workshop to a group of writers. One of the writers had a complicated plot I knew the story had a problem, but I couldn't figure out where to start fixing it. The details of the plot had become too confusing and complicated for me to sort out. As I remember it, there were bad guys and a sheriff and the heroine's brother in prison. I couldn't make sense of the characters' motivations, and I was getting confused because, as an outsider to the story, I wasn't sure what part of this chaos was important to the writer. I didn't know what to suggest she keep or what to urge her to throw away. I didn't know where to focus my attempts to fit the story. Okay, I said, there's a problem with this manuscript. We both know there's a problem and we don't seem to be able to fix it. This is your manuscript and let's say I'm going to throw it in the garbage here. I dropped it onto the floor beside me. There, I said, I've thrown it into the garbage. She leaned forward in her seat. I hope I wasn't going to take out be murdered. <laughs> Writers can be passionate about their ideas. Okay, I said, now your story is gone. There it is. 
It's in the garbage, and you're never going to be able to write it. I want you to think about it being in the garbage. I could feel her thinking. Now, if you could reach in and pick out just one part of this, that story, just one thing you don't want to let go of, what would it be? What she picked surprised me because I hadn't known that what was important to her in the story. It wasn't the sheriff or the brother in jail. It wasn't the bad guys. It was something I'd lost in the other details. It was the restaurant where all this confusing action was set, the restaurant which had gotten lost in a herd of characters with complicated problems. It was the restaurant she wanted to write about and how the people interacted there. I don't know whether she ever went on to write the story, but I have to thank her for giving me the motivation to come up with a garbage can test. Mind you, at the time I didn't realize that this test was something I might have a use for. A few weeks later, I told a friend about the way I'd used the garbage can on that workshop attendee. My friend turned around and used it on a story she was working on. Ah, it helped. I put it in my own arsenal of tools for writers and kept it for a rainy day. About two years later, can't remember quite, but two or three years later, I was working on a story I'd become very excited about. I'd started with a spark of an idea, a woman looking across a Mexican market, recognizing a man and running away in panic. I gave it a working title of market, and as I developed the story, I had to answer certain basic questions. Why was she there? Who was she? Why did she run? Somewhere I got lost in the details that resulted from trying to answer these questions. I can't write a story without well-motivated characters, and yet I'm not sure what their motivation was. But in my search for motivation, I became entangled in Mexican markets and water rights for Canadian ranches. So I added a presumed dead heroine and maybe a marriage, a wealthy family and fighting heirs. I also had a formless hero, the man the heroine ran from back in the Mexican market. This hero was determined to win the heroine as his life partner. I had pages of notes and even what looked like the outline of a plot, but I ground to a halt one day because I knew the truth. It was all a mess. There was no unifying energy to it. It wasn't a story, just a heap of ideas. I couldn't write this story. I was sick of the ranch I'd created. I was especially sick of the disputed water rights, the complicated tangle I needed to bring my heroine to that Mexican market. By this time, I realized a Mexican market didn't make much sense to this story, <laughs> and I dropped it. Suddenly, I was dealing with a heroine hitchhiking to get back to her family home because, oh, forget it, the whole thing was a mess. The part of me that couldn't seem to give up on this story just couldn't give up. I came very close to throwing the whole thing into the garbage can, and maybe that's what made me realize it was time to try my own garbage can test on me. I threw Market into my med mental garbage can. Okay, I said to myself, what is it you don't want to get? Look, get? <laughs> okay, I couldn't even say the sentence. I threw market into my mental garbage can. Okay, I said to myself, what is it you don't want to let go of? By this time, I was afraid I'd learned there was nothing here I cared about, in which case I would have moved the book into the ideas directory on my computer and started playing with another idea. But with the story in the garbage can, there was something I didn't want to let go of. A woman looking across a crowd sees a man she knows and runs in panic. It didn't really matter if it was a Mexican market. That was just local color. What mattered was the emotion, that feeling of panic when she saw him. As for the rest of it, frankly, I was glad to get rid of the ranch with messed up water rights. I was bored by that ranch. I was back at the original spark. Woman sees man in crowd. Woman runs, afraid he might have seen her. 
somehow my dear was alive again. I knew she hadn't seen this man in a long time. What if they'd been married and she left him? That's certainly not a story, but I'd succeeded in stripping away a bunch of non-essentials like the Mexican market and the arranged marriage. I'd gotten rid of a flock of garbage ideas. And somehow, now that I knew what was important, the story began to develop. The Mexican market became a mall in San Diego. My heroine became an artist who had married her childhood hero when he was 19 without understanding him as a person. The hero became a television news correspondent with a habit of walking straight into danger in far-off places, a man who always had to uncover the reasons behind events, a man who never gave up. That was synchronicity because I'd just read a biography of just such a man. I'd lost the ranch, the com complex water rights, even the Mexican market. By throwing away everything but the single important feature of the story I really cared about, which had a wealth of backstory in it, I'd gained real characters, strong conflict, and a plot going forward. I changed the working title of Market to Yesterday's Vows, wrote the book, and sold it. Since then, I've used the garbage can test at some point in almost every book I've written. In the rare event that when it hasn't worked, it's been because I've been at a point in my life as a writer where I need to take a break, where I have to step back from writing and re-examine my goals and myself as a person on what's important to me, just like my characters. Perhaps I've received a rejection from a publisher I expected to want my work. Rejections don't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with the writer's work, but every writer I know feels a sense of personal failure when a rejection arrives. I've written this part of my heart, my soul, and this piece of paper says, my heart, my soul are worthless. I'm worthless. I failed. I've learned I have to fight rejection to immediately affirm my own worth as a person and as a writer. I've learned to seek out my husband, tell him I'm depressed, listen to him, tell me he believes in me. If I'm really down, I need more. I go looking for all the affirmation I can find. Those affirming writer friends of mine get a phone call from me. One of them told me about her own warm, fuzzy album. What a great idea. I started my own fuzzy album. In it, I put ammunition to fight the feeling of low self-work that attacks all of us at times. In my warm, fuzzy album, I have a copy of every one of my book covers because those covers tell me I am a writer. I also have a copy of every good review of my books I've ever seen, and I don't read the bad ones. I have cards from friends who read my books and had nice things to say. Now, when someone tells me something I wrote touched them, I often ask if they would write that thought on a card and give it to me so I can put it in my warm fuzzy album. I also have cards from my children reminding me I'm a good mom, a good person. I have Valentines from my husband and Mother's Day cards to remind me I'm loved by a man who I love. Letters from people who attended my lectures and said I helped them that really nourishes me as a writer. I keep these things for the moments when I believe I'm worthless, that I'll never write another word and that no one values me. When I'm feeling low, I take out my warm fuzzy album and look through it. By the time I've got to the end, I've taken the first step back to self-confidence, back to finding myself again as a writer and as a person.